Any true desert is one of the most hostile environments there is. Whether it is mountainous or flat, desert temperatures may be 120 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. In the most hostile desert environments, your survival depends on your ability to get out of the sun, to conserve body water level as best you can, and to exist for 24 to 48 hours. Under such conditions, panic is almost surely fatal. But men have parachuted into desert areas and survived. If this should happen to you, remember that your parachute descent is your last chance to study the overall environment in which you're going to land. Spend these minutes looking for highways, railroads, towns, ranches, and water. The chances are 100 to 1 that you won't see any water on a desert. But you might see a spot of green in a canyon that means trees. And trees don't always mean surface water on a desert, but they certainly mean shade. There's no guaranteeing that your landing will be a good one. But easy does it, and you can survive. I was dazed at first. Wasn't sure where I was. I hadn't expected to be dragged into this big gully. I felt a sharp pain in my left arm, but it seemed to be okay. I'd only been there a few minutes. My mouth was dry and full of sand and I was sweating and hot. That sun was everywhere. The sand and gravel burned like blazes. I just wanted to get out of there. My right knee wasn't working too well, but I didn't feel any pain in it, for the moment, that is. I climbed out of the gully to see where I was, but I had a pretty good idea before I even looked. I was right in the middle of a great desert basin. There wasn't a house, a road, a telephone pole, and not even a speck of green. As far as I could see, everything was gray shriveled by heat and dead, or half dead. Even those mountains looked dead. And what was really bad, nobody knew I was here. I'd made a navigational error, an error I was working on when the bird caught fire. According to my last report, I was way north of here. That was a mistake I was going to pay for the hard way, right here. Even though it seemed level, the desert wasn't. It was creased with dozens, hundreds of dry gullies. And I wondered where the water was that had made them. My knee was beginning to hurt, hurt badly, and I wanted to sit down but I had to get out of that sun. I couldn't stretch my parachute across the gully I'd landed in. It was too wide, but I could sure stretch it across a little narrow one like this one. I went back to get my equipment. That is, I went back to where I thought it was, but my stuff wasn't there. Where was it? I tried to think. Nobody was there to swipe it. Was I lost already? When I came up out of that gully, I'd looked around. Had the mountains been on my left or right? On my left. They were still on my left. They should have been on my right going back. Everything looked the same around me. 
even the gullies. I was scared all the way through, but I knew I hadn't walked far, and if I was careful, I'd find my chute. And finally I did. All right. I'd learned something terribly important. I'd learned I could get lost on that desert almost easier than any place else, because everything looked the same. From now on, I'd keep my equipment in sight. The first thing I did was open that survival kit, because I knew there was water in it. I washed the sand out of my teeth and drank the first half pint. It was too hot to wear my helmet, and the sun hat and goggles were just right. My knee was killing me, and I knew by then that I'd wrenched it and that I'd have to bind it. Binding it steadied it, but it was in bad shape. I tried to work fast because I had to get out of that sun. I can see why they say, don't travel on the desert in the daytime. Any work at all takes it out of you fast. There are snakes on the desert, and I wanted to make sure I wasn't making camp with one. When I was sure there were no snakes there, I started cutting the chute so I could stretch it across the gully in two layers. I figured I needed eight panels to cover that ditch. That was only about a third of my chute. That would leave enough for the second layer and still more for signaling, bedding, or bandages. That sun on the back of my neck was like fever. I made a neck cloth, and I'll never be able to tell you how important it was to have that extra cover. Stretching that chute wouldn't have been much of a job if I had two good legs. And if the temperature had been 30 degrees less than what it was. But I finally got it done. Now all I had to do was stretch the second layer. When I got that done, I stuffed desert bushes in between the two layers to keep them apart. That made a dead air space between the sun and me a principle of insulation that would keep me a lot cooler. When I finished, I was sick. Sick from shock, overexertion, heat exhaustion, or sunstroke. I'm not sure which. I just know I was sick. Like everything else on the desert, I felt shriveled with heat. I was filthy dirty, and just for kicks, the old knee was banging at me. Never thought I'd ever use a raft in the desert, but I could never sleep on all those rocks. Seems to me I read someplace that to raise or lower the body above or below the desert floor would decrease the temperature. At least I was out of the direct sun, and I was still alive. So far, so good. I began the inventory of my equipment. There were a lot of things in that kit I might need just any old time. Food. 
matches. First aid. Snake bite kit. Three flares. One end of each for daytime signaling and the other end for night signals. And a signal mirror. When I looked in that mirror, a sunburned, dirty, sweaty bum looked back at me. The desert makes its mark on you fast. The radio. Try it now. It's simple to operate. It's always tuned to the emergency frequency. And it will broadcast as far as you can see. This is Captain Hammond calling any station. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. This is Captain Hammond calling any station. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. It was no good, and I knew why. They were still looking for me on the other side of those mountains where I should have been. There was desert over there, bigger than this one and just as mean. If they only had an aircraft flying high enough so that the mountains wouldn't cut off the signal. When they widened their search area, they'd find me. I just hoped they'd make it in time. There's a survival manual in the kit, and in the chapter on water, there's a little schedule of figures that tells the rugged truth. Days of expected survival in the desert, with no water at all when the temperature is 120 degrees Fahrenheit in the shade. And believe you me, in my little oven, it was more than 120 degrees. I could live two days without water. Two days if I had a quart of water and only two days if I had even two quarts of water. I had a total of one pint, and half of that was already gone. So I had only today and maybe tomorrow left. After that, nothing. I worried about signals, too. The canopy itself wasn't enough. In the meantime, I was going to have to practice using that mirror. I was going to learn to aim it at a particular bush or rock so that I could hit an airplane with it when I saw one. Every half hour. But the problem that really worried me was water. If I dug for it in that heat, I'd be long gone and whipped before I found it. I figured if I could just hold on until evening, until it cooled down, I'd be doing something big. Then, and only then, I'd be able to look for water and get out more signals. I judged the position of the sun by the shadows on the desert, but it was a long time before they seemed to lengthen. The sunburn ointment took the burn and dryness out of my cheeks and lips, and I sucked a pebble to keep my saliva coming. The book says, keep your clothes on, control your sweating. So I said to myself, stop sweating. But all afternoon, the stuff came out of my skin like water out of a sponge. I put out a radio call every half hour, but they were still looking for me on the other side of the mountains. I spent hours flashing my mirror until I just couldn't do it anymore. When the end of the first day finally came, I got out the food ration, chewed as much as I could, 
and washed it down with the last half pint of water. It helped. The desert cools down at night surprisingly fast. And in the evening, when you're not in danger of sunstroke and while you can still see, is the time to get your work done. The canopy didn't show up at night, and I wanted signal fires ready as fast as possible. I had my flares in my pocket. I thought I could light the fires faster by shoving a burning night flare into the brush than I could any other way. Three fires in a triangle, 50 yards apart is the rescue signal. But that might mean that I'd have to run 100 yards in the dark on that bum knee to light them in a hurry. So I put them only 25 yards apart. While I was gathering brush, I ran across a barrel cactus. I'd heard it was pulpy and moist inside. I didn't think much of it, but I marked where it was and went on building my fires. Some of that brush wasn't entirely dead, but I figured anything on that desert would be dead enough to burn. While I was building the signal fires, I kept looking for snakes. If a snake didn't bite me first, now I'd bite it. A snake is easy to kill, clean, and cook, and it's real food. After I finished laying the signal fires, I got the shovel from the survival kit to try digging for water. There was a dry riverbed about a quarter of a mile from my shelter that looked just like the one in the survival manual. I'd found it by following the deep gully. And when I saw how wide it was, I was pretty excited. It must have carried a lot of water in the rainy season, and maybe some of it was still there under the sand. The book said to dig in the lowest spot on the outside of a bend. There wasn't anything very green there, but it was the best looking spot I'd seen and I started digging. It was hard work, but I stayed with it because I needed that water so badly. Three feet down, the sand was still powder dry, and I gave up that hole. If there was any water there at all, the sand should have been at least damp. I dug another hole in a different bend in the river, but still no water. After the third hole, I was so tired I couldn't dig anymore. It was getting dark too, and my only chance was that barrel cactus. And that's when I saw the rattlesnake. I said, son, the book says you taste like chicken, and that's your tough luck.
Maybe it wasn't the neatest kill of the week, but it worked. Now all I had to do is get it back to camp, clean it, cook it, and eat it. When I came back to that barrel cactus, I gave it a good stiff kick with the heel of my good leg. To my surprise, it just rolled over. Its ropey root pulled out of the powder dry soil and I took it back to camp. I was amazed at how chill the desert became at night. And a fire gave me warmth and enough light to skin the snake and to work on that cactus. Snake skinning is a bit of a chore, but I got it done with not too much sand in the meat either. When I sliced it, I found I had little pink tender steaks. I salted them with crushed salt tablets. As soon as I got the meat cooking, I started to work on that cactus. It had so many thorns, I decided to hack away at it with my eye saw. I cut into it easily. It was wet, soaking wet. Now I was operating, and maybe I was winning. Maybe it wasn't water, but it was a substitute, and the dried glue in my mouth started to come loose. I sat there a long time eating snake steaks and chewing chunks out of that cactus. When I couldn't stay awake any longer, I pulled the extra piece of chute over me, and I must have gone to sleep instantly. It was after midnight when I heard the airplane. I came out of that sleep like a man shot out of a cannon. I grabbed my radio and yanked out a flare. It was so dark I couldn't see, so I popped the flare and headed for the first fire as fast as I could. I'd laid those fires carefully, and the brush burned fine. But it seemed a long time before I had all three of them going. As soon as I got that third fire going, I got on the radio and called. And called. But nobody answered and nobody came. Any airplane over that basin would have seen those fires. And I finally had to admit that maybe I'd dreamed I'd heard one when you're half-whipped and lost. Disappointment like that can be almost too much. You want to quit, give up. I just went back to sleep. And at dawn, I got ready for my second day. At the first show of light, I'd rebuilt the signal fires and I'd marked a big X on the desert just by scraping the ground and piling brush alongside. According to the book, X means I need food and water. It had taken a lot of work to make that X, but I figured that today was my last chance and I had to do everything I could to survive. 
Every place I went, I kept an eye out for snakes, but I didn't get any. I hadn't had any water since last night, and I honestly didn't know how I was going to make it for a whole day. I planned to spend it just sucking on a cactus and signaling. After the sun rose, that desert heated with a fast blast. It was so hot again that to touch the sand outside my shelter burned my hand. Oddly enough, however, it wasn't as hot inside my shelter as it had been the day before. I think that was because the rocks under the shelter didn't have a chance to heat up under the direct rays of the sun. I don't mean it was cool. My guess is that it was only maybe 120 degrees. By noon, I was dreaming about water. I didn't know whether I was just dozing and dreaming or whether I was getting delirious. But every time I stopped pushing myself, I was looking at water. for a moment in the middle of the afternoon and I tried to get hold of myself. As stunned as I was with heat, I thought about those air rescue boys. They never give up, but I hadn't been signaling for two hours. This is Captain Hammond calling any station. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Captain Hammond calling any station. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. And then it happened. This is Air Force Air Rescue 504 calling Captain Hammond. We read you. We have your bearing. I repeat. We that have voice your put bearing. some life in the old body. I dove right out into that sun and I didn't care. I was alive and they were going to find me. I used another night flare to start the fires. It's wonderful what hope does for you. It gives you the guts to do anything. Corked a day flare, and I kept on that radio. He couldn't miss me, and he didn't. Ordinarily, the air rescue service at the nearest air base will pick you off the desert in a matter of hours. But if you're really lost, you can survive long enough under even severe conditions for that pickup. You can survive providing you do not panic, providing you have the will to survive, 
and providing that you think. Remember, your brain is the finest survival kit you'll ever have.